Greetings, folks, and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This is your midweek roundup of all things Maker and Embedded and lovely. Now, we missed a show last week, and I'd like to apologize for that. I have been insanely busy. Um, I have been hosting the NXP Cup. By the time this video comes out, you're probably going to be able to watch the NXP Cup 2022 finals, which I hosted in Hamburg with NXP. Um, and we have a very interesting uh, Maker Day webinar coming up with Newton AI, which is a, a company which allows you to deploy models onto tiny uh, microcontrollers. It's all a tiny ML thing. Um, we'll talk about the, the, that later in this episode. Uh, this episode in general also just has a lot of very awesome things in it. Um, and as usual, it's way too much for me to fit into an episode. So I'm, uh, I'm going to try not to rattle through it too quickly. But yeah, I'm waffling and wasting time right now, aren't I? So let's get on with the show. To begin this week's show, I wanted to talk briefly about the Newton Maker Day, uh, which is a, a webinar that's happening on June the 16th. And it's quite exciting for me because uh, Electromaker are involved in this. I am moderating the webinar, something I've never done before. Um, I've done lots of things like this, talking to cameras and YouTube and even some stuff for television, but a webinar is new to me. Uh, it's a completely live thing. Um, and this webinar is about tiny ML. It's about deploying uh, machine learning models on microcontrollers, so it is very appropriate to Electromaker too. So the Newton Maker Day will have four speakers talking about different tiny ML projects. If you are interested in it, by the way, um, just quickly straight off the bat, it's on June 16th. It's at 5 p.m. CET and it's free to register. Uh, you can register right here. Um, the link in the description is to this blog post and it is the first link in the blog post. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to find it. Um, there's also a short introduction video here, which I urge you to watch um, because it goes into a little bit more detail than I'm going to right now. Um, but in short, there's going to be four talks, uh, all of which are real proof of concept, ready to use use proof of concepts on different ideas behind tiny ml uh, predictive maintenance of compressor water pumps will be one a smart shipment solution which allows you to not only track packages but see what condition they're in make sure they're not being thrown around for example slope control for robots which is quite an interesting one using an arduino nicola board to see if a, a roomba is sloping too much and getting stuck telling it to move in the opposite direction as soon as it notices it might be getting stuck which is quite a cool project and um uh, and yeah predicting the winner of the formula one race uh, which is a really fun one this uses a small formula Formula One car, um, uh, along with an Arduino sense board attached to it, and it uses data uh, gathered by just moving the car manually to make a simulated model that can be used to uh, deploy to actual cars. Uh, it's, they're all really nice ideas. You'll have the opportunity to hear each one of these authors talk about the projects, all of which are already available to read on the Electromaker website, by the way, under the projects section. Um, there'll also be a short Q&A. There's going to be some quite cool competitions as well, which I'm not going to say quite now because at the time of recording this, that hasn't been announced. But by the time this is recorded, um, you'll probably uh, see that, uh, yeah, there's going to be the chance to win uh, hardware from Arduino and books from Pact. I know I can say that, um, uh, but exactly how you can win them, you'll just have to come along to the webinar to find out. Anyway, this is something quite exciting for me because I've never been part of a webinar like this before and it is a subject that I'm very interested in. So if you would like to join us, head to the link. It's completely free and uh, yeah, uh, I'll see you when it happens, I guess. So moving on to the Raspberry Pi, specifically this, the Raspberry Pi 400. This has become my favorite computer in general because yeah, it's so convenient. You just plop it down and you can plug it into a screen or as I do frequently, my mini projector um, and you can just go. It's just a completely usable computer. It has a Linux command line. You can get at the GPIO pins if you want to um, and there's a lot I love about it. Um, now, Raspberry Pis in general have been very cloned. You get the Orange Pi, the Banana Pi, the Asus Tinkerboard and the Goral, uh, Google Coral Dev Board are all very Raspberry Pi shaped, you could say but there hasn't really been any clones of the Pi 400 up until now. So I was aware that Orange Pi were making their own clone of the Pi 400 and it was going to be called the Pi 800. Did you see what they did there? Um, but I wasn't aware um, that it was going to have the Rockchip RK3399 chip in it. Now we're on the always fantastic CNX software for this and as you can see it's a very very similar looking thing. It, they're going for the usual thing that they do which is making a proper clone um, and usually what Orange Pi do is they make a clone which is somewhat cheaper than the main Raspberry Pi and it does not have the same software. It has nowhere near the same level of support. They're fantastic if you know what you are doing. This one is a little bit different. Now, if you'd like to know the full specs, of course, you can come here, but in very brief, it's very similar to the Pi 400. It has four gigs of RAM. The RK3399 chip is comparable to the Broadcom chip uh, that the Pi uses, I'd say. Um, this one has 64 gigs of onboard flash, which is very nice. It also has a full size HDMI port, which is another nice thing. I don't particularly mind. I have a lot of HDMI small to large converters because of my cameras, but not everybody does. That's going to be quite a nice thing. In fact, you can see that all right here. 
Now, two quick things about this before we move on. Um, one, I didn't realize, I went to the English product page and of course I didn't go quite deep enough. CNX Software always does and apparently the Chinese product page had a bit more information than I saw originally. And that is that it's going to have Chromium OS on it, which is an interesting move, I feel like. Um, it's going to include Scratch and Python and as it says here, it's highlighting the education focus of the product. Um, and it's kind of weird. You'd imagine them to stick with something Linux-based. And I, I know, okay, under the hood, technically, Chromium, Android, I get that. Uh, but yeah, Ubuntu or uh, or Debian or something like that, um, they're choosing not to. And uh, apparently an Orange Pi OS is on the horizon, which on the one hand, I am very happy that they're attempting. But on the other hand, like I say, Orange Pi aren't necessarily brilliant at talking about how their software works ever. Um, so uh, hopefully that's going to be something that they document well. Who knows? The second thing about this, um, and by the way, there is no price for this as yet. This is something that, uh, as Orange Pi do frequently, they've just put up on the website, but there's going to be more details that trickle in as we go. Um, and uh, yeah, the thing that got me really excited about this is that I thought, oh, the RK3399 chip, that has the neural processing unit on it. This thing's going to be able to do amazing edge AI stuff just straight out of the box. And unfortunately, I got a bit too excited and uh, read more than that was actually there. It's the RK3399 chip, which is still a very powerful little chip. It's uh, on various Rock Pi boards. It's been used in various different single board computer clones, as it were, of the Raspberry Pi. But no, it's not the pro version. It doesn't have the neural processing unit on it. Despite that, I'm very glad that people are starting to attempt this uh, Pi 400 cloning business because um, I really am a fan of this form factor of kind of keyboard, this kind of computer, um, and I'm glad to see that there's going to be some variation of that theme in the future. I want to very briefly highlight a Reddit comment, which is something I don't often do on this show. We highlight uh, the news usually, or we talk about projects, but I do spend most of my time reading um, user-generated things about maker culture and um, embedded things, and I hope you didn't just hit, hear me hit the microphone. And there's one comment here, um, and, and again, there's no, uh, n there's no saying that this is actually fact. Um, but the people were talking about the ESP8266 and the Node MCU and how frustrating it is that it has less pins that can be used in other boards. And I thought this comment by... Uh, the wonderfully named Dumb Ninja was quite interesting. So let me just read that to you quickly. So in reply to a question about why these pins aren't so usable, mostly it's because when they designed the chip, they wanted a very small chip size, so a low number of total pins, but also a low price and flexibility, which means they didn't include the flash memory on the chip. They also wanted something any low-level manufacturer could solder, so they didn't go for a BGA, that is pads under the chip, package. Because the memory is separate and accessed through SPI, which automatically eats up four pins, then you still need basic stuff like a reset pin, some sort of boot select method, some actual power pins, ideally a few since you have a transmitter on board, two pins for a crystal oscillator, and you end up with just a few pins you can actually use. On top of that, dev boards take up two more pins with the serial port to upload code. I'm pretty sure their main idea for the chip was to be like a coprocessor only doing Wi-Fi and talking to a main microcontroller through serial. When they realized people were using this as a standalone thing, they designed the ESP32, which has more pins and more stuff that you'd want to use if you were using it standalone. Now, I have no idea if that's true. It's just something I found kind of interesting, but I'll leave a link to it in the show notes below. And uh, if you uh, agree, maybe you can join the conversation and say, this is really cool. I didn't know it. If you know it not to be true or you think this is just wild speculation, then you can, of course, go and say that. That's the whole point of Reddit. It's where people go to argue. I don't take part in the arguments. I just like to read. Uh, anyway, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. I thought it might appeal to the audience of this show, which is why I put it into this week's show. But let's get back to our more regular fare, shall we? Now, cyberdex. The concept of a cyberdeck is relatively simple. You put a computer into something which looks kind of futuristic, which is portable and small, um, which is something that is an alternate use case. It's not a desktop computer, it's not a laptop. Unfortunately, most of them are kind of not really that usable. They're a proof of concept more than anything, um, but you can make one with almost anything. You can put a Raspberry Pi and a, and a, a keyboard and a little monitor and a, a battery in it and call it good, or you could go way, way off the deep end, which is what we're about to look at now. However, when I say off the deep end, I don't necessarily mean this is bad. This is probably the best working version of a Cyberdeck I've come across. This isn't using a Raspberry Pi. This is using an actual PC. This is a gaming laptop that was very carefully put inside a case with a beautiful mechanical keyboard, um, a smaller display, but still a full HD display, um, that, which, as you'll see later in the video, he pairs with another display above it to make an actually very ergonomic uh, one and a half monitor setup. Um, and yeah, it's it's a fully working Windows computer, which of course you could run Linux on if you wanted to, rather than it being a Linux single board computer that's sort of being forced into uh, pretending to be something that it isn't. 
Now the core of this is the main board from a gaming laptop. Um, the original idea was to use one of Frameworks uh, motherboards that we talked about recently on the show that they're going to be uh, giving the old ones away, not giving, selling the old ones so you can uh, uh, use them in various projects. Um, uh, he just uh, took out the old uh, innards of a gaming laptop and basically chopped it up until it would fit into its case. Not all of it did, some of it had to go on the outside um, which just adds to the sort of uh, futuristic aesthetic of the project if you ask me to be honest. Um, and there are some moments in this which uh, were kind of slightly hair raising. I don't know whether it was just being said for effect but at one point he cuts in half a, a, a piece of a m2 ssd memory which he still has things on that he needs which kind of made the hair on the back of my neck stand up i've lost way too much stuff from drives that have uh, destroyed themselves or i've dropped over the years um but yes uh, this is a truly fantastic build and as you can see um uh, by the finished uh, product here it looks fantastic as well um and uh, as mentioned the actual dual screen display version of uh, what he uses it for it looks really quite nice and quite ergonomic i can imagine Imagine sitting and enjoying using that and again you have to rem remind yourself that this is running Windows 10 and running it well enough to run things like games and all that kind of stuff I absolutely understand why to some of our viewers that is not a good thing that is a bad thing you don't want to touch Windows with a stick but as someone who's quite agnostic to OS at this stage um yeah, the idea of a cyber deck with Windows 10 is something I find quite interesting. And as always, the video itself and the build process is fascinating, really worth a look. So I will leave a link to it in the description. I'd love to know what you think of it. Would you use a cyber deck like this or would you be more interested in something Raspberry Pi based? I mean, we talked about the Pi 400, which is already most of the way there. Um, I'm always interested to see what people think about these kind of projects because I really love them. I wanted to very quickly point out that we have a new Electromaker Educator video out. Now, I'm sure those of you who already have your subscriptions turned on and uh, all that kind of stuff on YouTube were aware of this, um, but Robin has been putting out videos which are a bit more of a technical nature, paced slightly differently to what I do, and they're all wonderful so far. Um, this is a, a relatively deep dive into ways that you can save power in your projects, but it's uh, presented in a way that is understandable to people who aren't engineers, i.e. me. Um, and uh, it also uses the Nordic Power Profiling Kit in order to actually show you exactly how these power saving things uh, can work. And as someone who fiddled with the Power Profiling Kit when I wrote about it some time ago, it's, it's a really fun bit of kit as well. Um, but there's a lot of really super awesome tips here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them right now, but hopefully as you see, I'm uh, uh, scrolling across here. You can see the name of the chapters using different uh, power reduction tips and tricks. And of course, uh, the way you code things is uh, important as well. Turning off peripherals that aren't being used, for example. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I'll leave a link to it in the description. Um, I really enjoy Robin's videos. They're made completely separately to me in a different country, um, and it really brings me joy to see more Electromaker stuff coming out. Uh, so let me know what you think of the Electromaker Educator series, and we'll see if we can convince Robin to make a few more. If you are enjoying what we do here on the Electromaker Show, it would mean a lot to us if you would click the subscribe button underneath the video and click this little bell here. Um, this doesn't give you notifications that will show up on your desktop unless you tell Chrome that you want that, which I wouldn't do in my personal uh, space, <laughs> but it does give you uh, notifications inside of YouTube. So in the top corner here, you will get notifications. Um, and I just want to make a point uh, that you will only be getting notifications for the main show and for the Electromaker Educator videos. Um, you will not be getting notifications every time we post a short video that would be very very annoying but the way YouTube works is that once it picks up shorts it does not put them in the notifications um, it just gives you the main episodes here uh, the other thing is if you could click like that would be a useful thing for us uh, again it's an asinine thing that all YouTubers do please click like and subscribe but the reality of the way YouTube works is that if you do that it makes it far more likely that YouTube will recommend it to other people and that will allow our channel to grow However, a less algorithm-based way of helping us would be to buy things from the Electromaker store. We uh, have a large amount of stuff from a huge amount of suppliers, as you can see. We are not immune from the semiconductor shortage. Everybody is hurting a bit in that regard at the minute, but we still have a surprisingly large amount of stuff in stock. If you are thinking of starting up a project or need to replace a peripheral or are just looking for something like, for example, uh, a battery pack to do a, a project with, we have a big supply of stuff on the store. And um, the simple best way that you can help everything that we do at Electromaker is with the store. Um, I've said it many times, uh, but I think it bears repeating. Um, we don't put adverts on our videos. We don't monetize anything that we do. Um, we just have the store. If you get any adverts on this video, they're the ones that YouTube have put there and they don't benefit us whatsoever, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, um, if you do want to help us out, the store is the best way to do it. But anyway, that is enough of this for now. Let's get back to the interesting stuff in the show. 
It is time for the mystery box competition, and it's a very simple competition. We have a mystery box full of mystery items. Uh, it says mystery right here. And it was given to us by the wonderful people at Mauser. It says Mauser right here. And basically, I put my hand in it, and whatever comes out is the prize that we give away at random on this week's show. Oh, sugar. I almost dropped the mystery box. Now, this is the box inside the box I had my hand on before I almost accidentally dropped all of them on the floor, but I managed to avoid doing that. Um, and I know exactly what this is because we've given away one of these before. Yes, inside this box is a development board from Texas Instruments, and it's kind of an interesting one. It's based on the MSP430FR2X line, which is a name, I know. Um, but this is a low-powered microcontroller that can do quite a lot. It's a 16-bit microcontroller, it has a 12-bit analog-to-digital converter, but it also has DACs on it. Um, and I believe they're quite high resolution. Uh, yeah, 12-bit digital-to-analog converters on their programmable gain amplifiers, um, and it's designed to be low power as well. Um, as I say, we've given one of these away before, and um, every time that, uh, we've come past these in the past I've been sort of interested in them I'd love to get my hands on one and mess with one myself however this one is destined for one of you now, if you're new to the show, the mystery box competition really is kind of random. Um, I've made a point of not looking in the box, or at least to the best of my ability. I've, I've had a few spoilers. Um, and whenever I pull something out, I genuinely don't know what I'm going to give away. And also, the way that we choose a winner is we take all of the comments from the previous week's show and we choose one at random. Uh, so yeah, it really is quite a random thing. Anyway, um, this week's winner is Ralph Yamamoto, who's been watching the show for quite a while. I've seen you in the comments quite a lot, Ralph. Um, whose comment was, these CM4 type replacements look interesting, referring to the Compute Module 4... Um, um, clones we were talking about on last week's show and it might be challenging with the lack of a large uh, user community though uh, which is exactly the point I was making at the time uh, certainly with things like Orange Pi they make wonderful hardware uh, which is not documented very well and not very easy to use unless you really know what you are doing anyway congratulations Ralph we'll be in touch with you as how we can get this out to you and uh, the mystery box competition will be back next week we also have a few named competitions coming up as well for some quite interesting stuff so yeah stay tuned for that but for now let's get on with the rest of the show <laughs> We are moving on now to funding website things, where we talk about things on funding websites. Um, and I am really quite excited about this one this week. I have been waiting to talk about this um, because this pre-launch uh, project on Crowd Supply ticks so many boxes for me that I just, yeah, I'm really excited to be able to talk about it. So, um, a little synthesizer history. Um, a few years ago, a company called Teenage Engineering turned up and they started making these crazy looking synthesizers and drum machines. You're looking at one on the left here. Uh, this is a, a pocket operator and uh, this one um, is a, a, a drum machine. And don't be fooled by the way that they look. The Teenage Engineering line of synthesizers uh, are really quite amazing. Uh, they also make some super expensive things like the OP1 and the OP1 Field and I'm not as into those. I feel like they're kind of slightly overpriced and there's better things in that range but in terms of this and the DIY kits you can get for the pocket operators there's just nothing quite like them they're really really fun now this on the right is the pocket integrator and this is what the crowd supply project is about uh, you won't be getting a pocket operator along with this this is an add-on for a pocket operator you will need to buy that separately but I would recommend doing so if you're into synthesizers they're such fun um, however this is just a really really wonderful thing this uh, as it says here uses a MEMS accelerometer and it allows you to play drum patterns and synthesizers by tapping and shaking your pocket operator just like a handheld percussion instrument do is tap out the rhythm that you're hearing in your head or in the room around you and it'll follow that rhythm once you let go of the buttons. You can stop on a dime at any moment, pick a new rhythm, and go with that. So yes, if you want to watch the full video, head over to the um, Crowd Supply page. Um, I just realized that was probably a little bit large there, but I don't think I was actually taking up too much of the page. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a really interesting project. Um, not only can you tap it like that, but it can take a sync pulse in as well. So essentially, you can... Uh, say you know he has a snare drum there you could put a pad on the snare drum and tap through it picks up the sync pulse it gives that sync pulse to the pocket operator and it also passes it on you could have one piezo uh, attached to your bass drum for example in your band and it can go into this and out of this not only will it trigger the pocket operator it will give you a sync pulse for everything um, this kind of thing is a real headache to get your head around as a musician i've played in many bands over the years that have combined electronic music and uh, analog or not analog i mean i guess it is analog music but human musicians <laughs> instruments <laughs> uh, and yeah it's hard to get that right this is just really exciting to me um, if you'd like to know more about it i will of course leave a link to this in the description it is a pre-launch campaign. There's no price for it yet. We'll be coming back to it when it goes live. If you would like to, you can always put your uh, uh, email address in here. I have absolutely done that for this project, but we will definitely be coming back to this one when it goes live too. Um, 
Yeah, um, these little pocket operator synths I, I, I find great fun, and they're almost electromaker appropriate in that you can get them in kit form, um, but this is just a wonderful add-on and it seems to have been done in such a good way. We're moving over to Kickstarter with Step FPGA, um, and uh, this project uh, grabbed my attention, uh, not because it needs funding, they've actually already completely smashed their goal, they've doubled it, um, but just because um, beginner FPGA boards is a real difficult thing to get done in general because by nature the way FPGAs work is incredibly complex. If you've even done the most beginner basic getting started guide to FPGAs it's a lot of new terminology and a lot of new things to take on board and one of the things I liked about this project is that this is yeah it, it's designed to uh, to pull away some of the harder things to make magic boxes of some of the harder concepts and teach you the basics in a way that works. So really there's two sides to this project. There's the hardware side and there is also a written tutorial side to it. And as you can see, this is a USB Type-C equip board with a couple of seven segment displays on it. It has a few other things that you might want as well. I quite like this video of the slow pan under a microscope across the board. I wish more people would do this with their stuff actually. Um, I know it sounds ridiculous, but uh, even if it's something that I might not actually want to buy myself, I love seeing that. However, that's not the case with this board. Um, I, given the price, I'm actually really excited about trying this out. However, that brings me on to the second point, which is that this is not just a hardware project. You can get just the hardware. Um, if you pay 59 Canadian dollars, you will get just the board sent out to you without soldered pins, like you get most boards these days. Um, and that there is a simple user guide. Um, a lot, and they also have a web IDE, which we'll come onto that in just a moment. Um, however, uh, this is also something that has a, a, a educational side to it. So the educational aspect of this board is, I think, what really sets it aside. Uh, this is the table of contents for an entire book you get. Uh, however, you have to uh, have a slightly different level of pledge for this. And this isn't a book I've had the chance to read yet because it is part of the project. If you pay 109 Canadian dollars or more, you will get the hardware, of course, but you also get a digital copy of this tutorial book. And it seems to be a very thorough tutorial, not just covering uh, the basics of how to use this board, but the basics of FPGAs in general, and also things like uh, the difference between VHD and Verilog. Is VHDL the right acronym for the programming language? I can't even remember the name of the programming language, despite understand the language. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there's something about this that I feel like is a bit more complete than many other projects like that I have seen. I was going to wait until the beeping stopped. I don't know if you can hear the beeping outside, uh, but the beeping is not going to stop, so I'm not going to wait anymore. Apologies if that's annoying. <laughs> The other thing they have is a web IDE, and I think this is a, a good idea. Um, the tools that you use for a lot of embedded hardware programming are quite scary to those who are not used to them. If you've only come from the Arduino IDE, even moving on to STM32, if you're doing it with the uh, STM32 uh, cube IDE, whatever it's called, can be quite intimidating. Um, and the idea that they have their own web IDE that you will have access to in order to learn things in the basics, uh, learn how to do things, is really nice. There are some fantastic FPGA tools out there, but uh, yeah, this is a really good way of doing it. Um, I think I've talked about this one project enough for now to see if you'd be interested in it or not. If you would like to, there's still 27 days to go, and as previously mentioned, you can get the board for around 60 Canadian dollars. Um, you can also get it for 109 Canadian dollars. I don't know what that is in American. I know that's about 80 euros. Um, and yeah, of all of the kind of beginner FPGA projects I've seen in recent times, this one seems like it is the most complete. Of course, I'd be very interested to see what it is like when it finally goes uh, when I finally get a hold of one because yeah this is one of the ones that I have uh, I have decided I'm kind of in on I would like to finally learn how to use FPGAs and hopefully with this I can get through the basics uh, and then actually start doing the harder stuff at some point in the next 20 years <laughs> We're going to close out this week's show by looking at a new RP2040 board and a very interesting use of Tiny ML. But before that, a bit of news that I'm really pleased to uh, to say this: uh, the Arduino user groups are back. Now, it pleases me so much to say that, not because I'm someone who's been involved in Arduino user groups, but because I'm someone that understands the value of meeting in person to play with hardware together and to learn together. Um, I have helped a few people take their first steps down the Arduino journey, not as part of official groups, uh, uh, just, just I can have. Um, and there's something really valuable about that. I've also been uh, to a few hackathons where you just get there and there's a pile of stuff and you bring your own project and everyone tries to help each other. Um, as someone who is quasi-social, I don't really go to things very often, um, but I do really enjoy them when I do, um, I found that kind of thing to be very valuable. And Arduino user groups are basically a formalized version of that. Um, there have been Arduino user groups all over the place. I'd be very surprised if there isn't still an active one in Berlin. There was one when I got here, but I've never actually been to my, to my shame. But if there isn't one in your area, you can start one. Um, there's an AUG web page, which is specifically for Arduino user groups, and you can use this in order to start your own groups. You can apply to make them, and you will receive support from Arduino in doing so. 
So I'm going to leave it at that. I will leave a link to this blog post in the description of the video. I am very glad to hear that Arduino user groups are back. If any of you are part of a user group or wanting to start a user group or have any questions about it, please do let me know in the comments of this video and I will do everything I can to kind of grind that down to something that might be a bit more helpful to you. Although this blog post does cover pretty much everything you should need to know. Um, yeah, helping others in physical space is a great way to get started as a, a teacher moving away from just doing stuff um, for yourself. It's just something that I think is really, really wonderful. Now onto that RP2040 board. Look at it. These are so lovely. These are really lovely little things. Um, they are uh, USB-C with tiny little OLED screens on it and a little quick connector here as well. Um, and uh, as with all quick connectors, if I remember correctly, quick I2C is the same as Stemma QT, the Adafruit one. They have cross compatibility. And of course, there's a few nice GPIO pins to work with here too. I love tiny development boards. I love USB-C. I love a lot about this. I think the thing I love about the most is the price as well, because you can get these on Banggood for about 10 euros. Uh, uh, oh, $10. So I'm guessing that's going to be around 9 euros. Um, and uh, yeah, and they're available on AliExpress as well. And as the wonderful CNX software article points out, if you're just interested in the little OLED displays, you can get those separately on AliExpress as well. Um, if you'd like to know more about it, head to the link in the description. I'll be linking CNX as I always do. This is quickly becoming my go-to site for everything. Um, and uh, yes, uh, just I couldn't not put this in this week's show despite having so little time because look at it. It's such a cute little thing. Finally this week, a project from the University of Ljubljana. Uh, this is Safe Drill, um, and this uses Tiny ML in a really interesting and specific way. It's one of the first projects where I've seen Tiny ML used and thought, oh yeah, that's just how things are going to work in the future. Because essentially what this does is it detects whether you're using the right drill bit with the right material. Um, if you've used a hand drill before, you'll know that there are certain drill bits that are supposed to be wood and certain drill bits that are used to be stone and that there is a distinct difference between those two drill bits. You should only use one for each thing. By the way, I'd like to point out again, I think I said this in last week's show, I apologize if the show's cut up in a weird way. Um, I am being brutalized by hay fever this year, despite taking antihistamine, so I'm having to stop every few seconds to itch my face. I apologize if this is a little bit disjointed because of that. Um, but yeah, it's been really weird this year. I'm having trouble breathing, I'm coughing, my face is itchy. Uh, usually don't have it this bad. Anyway, safe drill. Um, what they've got here is an Arduino Nano BLE 33 cents, I believe. Um, and uh, what it does is it collects data of a drill bit being used correctly. So you use a wood drill bit for wood, a masonry drill bit for stone, and it collects that data and it says, okay, this is the acceptable kind of vibrations you should expect from using a drill. Presumably, using that same data, you should be able to detect whether someone is pushing too hard or not. Because, for example, with masonry drills, you're not supposed to, oh well, with hammer drilling, you're not supposed to push at all. Um, yeah, there's a few interesting things that this could actually uh, throw up. Um, this is on the Arduino blog. It's wonderfully written up there. There's also a link out to their project page. Um, I'll leave a link to it in the description. But as I said at the start of this section, this is the first time I saw something and thought, oh yeah, like in the future, at some point, all the, uh, we're going to get to the point where the hardware is cheap enough that you're just going to get a drill which will tell you when you're drilling right or wrong. It's just going to be a little alarm on it and it's going to go beep, wrong drill bit, or beep, you're doing it wrong. And it's just going to be part of our day to day. It's the first time where I've seen this tiny ML stuff and thought, yeah, okay, this is exactly how it will slot into our future. And it was kind of an interesting feeling for me. <laughs> That was the show for this week. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you for all the support you continue to show us. Um, there's a lot going on at Electromaker right now. I've been very, very busy. And like I, say at the start, like I said at the start of the show, I'd like to apologize for missing last week's show. Sometimes it's just something that has to go by the wayside while everything else keeps going. Um, if you are interested in the Newton Maker Day, uh, do head to the description of the video. That's where you can join up for the webinar. It is free and um, I am hosting it. Um, but uh, other than that, I hope you have a fun, safe and creative week and I'll chat to you next time.